Much of Ontario reopens later this week after the unprecedented emergency shutdown due to COVID-19. But that doesn't mean things go back to the way they used to be. Physical distancing and hand washing remain critically important. And masks may also have a big part to play. But there's a range of views on that, so let's get into it. We welcome, from University Park, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C., Michelle Gelfand, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of Maryland and author of Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. In London, Ontario, Dr. Ken Milne, Chief of Staff at the South Huron Hospital Association and an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine at Western University. And in Burlington, Ontario, family physician Dr. Jennifer Kwan, one of the medical advocates behind hashtag Masks for Canada. Thanks all of you for taking our calls and joining us tonight on TVO. I just want to start with a, some results from a couple of surveys here. Uh, Leger, which is a polling firm in Canada, and the Association for Canadian Studies released some data surveying more than 1,500 Canadians who were asked where they wear a mask. And you can all see this, but I'm going to describe this in some detail for those who are listening on podcast. Um, the red bars are Ontario, uh, the darker bars are Canada, and the I guess, what is that? Turquoise or teal bars are United States. And uh, as those of us who are watching on TV can see, 60% say when they're grocery shopping, they put a mask on. 53% uh, of Ontarians say when they go to the pharmacy, they put a mask on. 21% uh, for the office of the workplace, 16% for public transit, again in Ontario, and only 16% for when they take a walk. If you look at the American numbers, they're all a little bit higher. If you look at the cross Canada numbers, they're all a little bit lower. Let's do one more here. Uh, respondents were also asked, should masks be mandatory in public and in confined spaces, such as grocery store, shopping malls, or public transit? And again, for people in the province of Ontario, 60% came back with a yes, 30% said no, 10% undecided. Uh, just, I, I'd like all of you just to sort of crunch those numbers and give me your initial reaction to it. Uh, Jennifer, you want to start on that? What jumps out at you from those numbers? So it looks like the numbers have been gradually increasing in terms of the numbers of Ontarians and Canadians wearing masks. So it's good that they're increasing, but many people are saying that we do need about 80% mask adoption to have a significant impact on the amount of COVID-19 transmission. That also depends on the disease prevalence in that individual community. So it will be interesting to see how we can encourage more Canadians to wear masks who are able to do so, so that we can continue to contain the virus. Indeed. Michelle, how about you? What jumps out at you? Uh, well, I'm not too surprised by the mixed reaction and general resistance we're seeing it, to wearing masks. For many, it's really a matter of defending their freedom. And these mindsets really run deep. They reflect our cultural DNA, particularly in the, in the U.S. and Canada. And so in my research, I've differentiated cultures that are tight, that have strict rules and punishments for deviance, which with those that are loose, that have weaker rules and more permissive. And what we know is that tight cultures have generally had a lot of threat across their histories, like disasters, disease, and invasions. Uh, and these contexts rules really help people to coordinate. And so people have learned that they, they're they important. But loose cultures, which have less chronic threat, have had the luxury of being able to be more permissive. So they have a lot of reactance against being told what to do. And, and as per the last comment, I think we need a healthy balance. We need to really kind of tighten up and follow rules when there is real threat, but we can loosen when it's, you know, when we have less threat. And we need clear messages around the level of threat to be able to do so. Ken, what do you see in the numbers? Oh, I just see how smart Canadians are because they're risk stratifying. They say in some environments, yeah, it makes sense. In other environments, I'm out for a walk, not so much. So it just shows how smart Canadians are. But I would be skeptical, that would be my general position, on any self-reporting survey. Because if you approach a person and say, do you wear a mask or when do you wear a mask? They may be more likely to say they do. And there's also a lot, another little nuance to that. What type of mask are they talking about? Are they talking about a cloth mask? Are they talking about a medical mask? An N95 mask? What type of mask? And on top of that, are they wearing the mask correctly? It's not dichotomous. Yes, I've got a mask on. No, I don't have a mask on. Are they wearing it under their nose? Are they covering their chin? Are they doing the Van Gogh with one ear only? You need to wear a mask correctly. Hmm. The Van Gogh. Okay, that's a new one on me. I hadn't heard that one before. 
Uh, Jennifer, clearly there's a lot of different levels to this thing. Uh, do you want to give us your advice right now on what you think people ought to be doing in terms of what kind of mask, how they ought to be wearing it, et cetera? Um, so one point um, Ken brought up is definitely proper mask wearing is very important. Uh, generally, we want the mask to be covering both your nose and your mouth because this is a respiratory virus that's generally transmitted from the nose and the mouth. Um, and the recommendation also is to make sure you don't touch the outside, make sure you're taking it on and off with the loops to ensure that you're not, um, you know, contaminating um, your hands uh, and to wash or discard mask appropriately depending on the type of masks. Generally for um, uh, the general public that uh, non-medical masks are the current recommendation. So that would be cloth masks or homemade masks. Um, this is generally also due to the PPE supply shortages that medical grade masks should be saved for healthcare workers and uh, frontline um, people who are taking care of patients who may have COVID-19. That being said, these recommendations may change if um, the supply issue is solved. And let me do a quick follow-up with you. You wrote uh, an open letter to health officials in this country. You signed on to it this week. Just give us a sense of what's in that letter. So there's a group of physicians across Canada um, from various specialties, emergency physicians, family doctors, ophthalmologists, and also a lot of people who signed are optometrists, dentists, dental hygienists, just from across all specialties who are concerned that um, because of the um, low uptake of mask wearing um, in Canadians, that it will not be sufficient to control um, additional outbreaks, especially as we are reopening. So we're hoping that um, public health officials will take a stronger stance um, for masks, especially in high risk situations, um, which are ACT, A-C-T. So um, all public indoor spaces, uh, crowds where you cannot distance from others and transit. So in those high risk situations um, and in areas of where there's high disease prevalence, we would recommend public health officials to consider mandating masks so that we can uh, protect Canadians. Well, that gets nicely to my next question. And of course, everything is political nowadays. So mm -hmm. Michelle, I'd like you to weigh in on this. As you know, your president never wears a mask and certainly never wants to be photographed wearing a mask. Uh, the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, uh, frequently is seen in public wearing masks. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, is frequently seen in public wearing masks. Um, Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, when he has gone out into the community, for example, to load up stocks of PPE onto his pickup truck, he has been seen photographed wearing a mask. Um, any advice for politicians on when they should and when they shouldn't wear a mask? Yeah, well, to your point, this really is a strange historical moment. I mean, usually when this collective threat, people unify, they become cohesive, they tighten and they follow rules in order to survive threats. Uh, and this makes a lot of evolutionary sense. But there's a lot of confusing signaling going on um, all over the place, particularly in my country, where you see senior leadership really discarding the rules. And what you find is that their followers, you know, their base then follows the leader. Um, and that's really problematic when there's a lot of threat. Um, and it's what I call an evolutionary mismatch. Um, and so I think we really need to um, try to have more collective discussion and, and more clear signaling throughout this upcoming continuing epidemic. Ken, the, the president clearly appears to be making a political statement by declining to follow his own policy and wear a mask where he ought to be. For example, when he's in a crowd of people. I, I, I know you're not of the view that everybody needs to wear a mask all the time in all circumstances, but would you agree that there are actually some circumstances where even Donald Trump ought to put a mask on? So I try very hard not to comment on politics in general and specifically American politics. <laughs> uh, it can be a bit of a okay. minefield. Um, so I'll speak to the science. And what the science says is we have some weak evidence with regards to types of masks and types of situations. And we need to be very careful not to overstate or overinterpret the evidence. And so there are situations where it absolutely clearly has potential benefit. So if I'm riding the rocket in Toronto, I'm, I'm going to be a superhero and mask up. But if I'm fishing in Kenora, oh, I love Kenora. It's such a beautiful <laughs> lake of the woods. But if I'm fishing in Kenora and there's three boats on the lake and it's public and I'm the only person in the boat, I don't think we need to mandate 
masks. And so we need to empower people, educate people, respect their autonomy and agency. And, and I'm very pro smart mask. And so wear a mask when it makes sense that it will probably limit transmission of an infectious disease. But certainly I do not think mandatory and universal can be supported because there are, of course, age groups, children under the age of two shouldn't be wearing a cloth mask because it's a choking hazard. But in general, there are places to wear a mask and places not to wear a mask. And we need to be better on the messaging about when and where those places are. Jennifer, would you agree that those are common sense protocols that we ought to follow in that way? Absolutely. So um, empowering people to make decisions about their own health is very important. Um, and I agree that if you're in the middle of the lake fishing, no, you don't need to wear a mask. Um, and definitely, all proponents for mask wearing. Certainly, we also focus on um, exceptions. You don't, if you have a medical condition, if you have um, someone with a disability or another contraindication to mask wearing, then no, nobody should be forcing you to wear a mask and nobody should be judging you or shaming you for not wearing one and you don't have to be explaining yourself. Um, and no, young children should not also be wearing a mask. That being said, my hope is that anybody who can wear a mask will wear one in order to protect those who may be more vulnerable around us. Well, you've all referenced at various points the kind of advice we get from our top public health officials and, and whether we take that advice. And a, a number of critics have pointed out that's often been hard to do because the message has not always been clear. And we just want to play a little clip here. This is Teresa Tam, whom, of course, all Canadians know now, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, mm -hmm. nationally speaking, and her position on masks and whether to wear them and when to wear them and where to wear them has changed a bit. Tony, let's roll that clip. Putting a mask on a asymptomatic person um, is not beneficial, obviously, if you're not infected. Canadians can wear uh, these coverings or uh, non-medical masks if they can't maintain physical distancing. So um, it, is, it is a permissive statement. If you can't predict whether you can maintain that two meter distance, then it's recommended uh, that you wear the non-medical mask or facial covering. Now, Ken, the criticism has been not only that her position has changed, but that she was sort of late to the party to encourage people to wear masks. You remember at the beginning, she was actually saying there was no evidence at that point that wearing a mask was helpful. And in fact, it could be harmful because it might encourage you to touch your face more than you ought to. Uh, you want to weigh in on whether or not you think her advice um, to delay wearing masks was justified? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for her and what a difficult job she must have. My position as chief of staff is to look out over my hospital and my community in general. She's looking out over all Canadians. So what an awesome responsibility she must have. And I think it's a sign of intelligence that she changes her position because as new information comes in, as scientists, we should adapt and change our position based on new evidence. And so if there's evidence out there at one point and new evidence comes out at another point, we should be flexible and nimble enough to be able to translate that information to the general public. And we should be open and honest with the public about the uncertainties. And we lose credibility if we come in and say, thou shalt wear a mask when we don't have great evidence to support thou shalt wear a mask in certain situations well jennifer in fairness she was taking her cues from the world health organization which also has not necessarily been uh consistently offering the right message at the right time um you know do, do we cut her some slack for that so I don't want to be pointing fingers at anybody because I'm at home sitting on my couch, whereas, um, you know, our public health officials are responsible for the lives of millions of Canadians. And they also have to be balancing things such as the economy, whereas as a physician, I'm mainly um, looking through a medical lens. So I definitely will not be um, saying, you know, people did this wrong or things like that, but we can kind of offer our help in guiding the public towards what we think is correct from a medical perspective. Okay, fair enough. Michelle, let me try this with you. Do you think the messaging on both sides of the border 
in terms of advice to people on mask wearing has been appropriate and consistent all the way through? Uh, no, I think it's been a conflicted, uncoordinated mess, actually. And I, as I mentioned, I think when we have a lot of threat, we really need to follow rules. It's evolutionarily adaptive. But we need to deep, deep into the psychological motivations that people might have that might really kind of butt against that general rule. Um, people who um, don't like rules and are more impulsive, I call them sort of having tight mindsets, uh, really get upset when they have been told what to do, uh, whereas people who veer tighter are more attentive to rules. Uh, you could take my uh, tight, loose mindset quiz on my website to figure out where you might fall in the default. Uh, but I think it's important, again, to think about the psychological motivations. Um, there's some research coming out of the U.S. that's under review that shows that, for example, men in general are much more reluctant to wear masks than in part that's due to the fact that they think it makes them look weak um, and not cool. And so we really need to, in our messaging, not just really be clear on the level of threat, but then really be able to nudge in a sense, people who maybe have reactants against it for a variety of different reasons. Well, let me get you, Michelle, to weigh in on, um, you know, Jennifer gave us a, a good acronym earlier, ACT, A for all indoor spaces, C for crowds where you can't, and T for transportation. You know, if you're on the subway, for example, and it's packed, those are good places where you'd want to have a mask. Uh, any issue with, with the ACT acronym that Jennifer laid out earlier? No, I think it's great because I think we need these kind of heuristics to be able to remember. And all of those issues point to the fact that we might have more threat in those contexts. And um, that's where we really need to have masks. Um, so helping people to understand um, that there's a place and there's a time to wear masks and how to wear them is really critical in our communication. Ken, how about you on the acronym ACT, as in that's where you should or don't have to wear a mask? I like it because it's action oriented <laughs> and it's right there in the name. I would say act like a superhero. Superheroes wear masks. Superheroes are strong. Why not wear a mask when it's appropriate? So I think acting like a superhero and being a smart mask wearer is a really great idea because to communicate to the public, we need to have a combination of education and entertainment. And so it has to be a digestible message. And so I think that's a great way to do it. And I'm really impressed with uh, Dr. Kwan coming up with the act acronym. Now, I don't want to be a smart aleck here, but you know that, that Robin only wears a mask over his eyes and Batman only wears it over his eyes and his <laughs> nose. So you, you know that I, that I have an online persona of Bat Doc, where I talk like <laughs> Christian Bale. But I promised Dr. Kwan that I wouldn't bring out my Batman mask for this interview. <laughs> Wise. Okay. Well, tell me this, Kat. How about um, in businesses, in the office, would you wear a mask there? In businesses? So mm -hmm. my evidence-based medicine answer is, it all depends. What kind of business? How close am I to that person? What kind of contact am I having with that person? Certainly we've seen with certain meat packing plants and stuff where you can't physically distance and there's a lot of wet stuff flying around. I'm not privy to how, you know, my meat is prepared, but you know, that's close contact. And you could also be working in a business that's a Home Depot that's the size of five football fields and there's only 10 people in there. So I think it all depends on the actual situation. Okay, Jennifer, what does the evidence tell us about how useful it is to take, I mean, if you don't have a real N95 mask or a real piece of PPE, just a cloth, cover your nose and mouth with a cloth and tie it around the back of your head. How useful is that? So adding on to Ken's answer, it all depends because even <laughs> it depends on the type of cloth, you know, like how many layers you have, how well people are wearing it. So it really does depend. And, you know, we're hoping there will be more studies to help us understand that. Um, and But generally, if you think about someone coughing, speaking, sneezing, you know, when there's droplets coming out of your mouth, generally um, a piece of cloth would catch most of the droplets. Now, the viral particles people are saying, oh, they're very small they can fit through the holes but generally the virus is transmitted within droplets and the droplets themselves are big enough to be caught by the mask and the question is how much would like to respond to that please go on in right now so i think what jennifer is talking about or dr kwan is talking about is very important when it comes to cloth masks and we have to be very clear we do not have good evidence that cloth masks will have a net benefit um, there's a study under play, undergoing right now. It's a Dutch study of 6,000 people. They have 3,000 that are going to be wearing a mask in public and encouraged to do it, and 3,000 that will not be. 
doing that. They'll just have the control group. And it started recruiting in April. The data will be available at the end of June, the end of this month. And then we'll actually have some real data on whether or not cloth mask wearing, actually they're using surgical masks, but wearing a mask in public will prevent COVID-19 transmission. And I'd like to get the other doctor who's a expert in behavior on board on this, because my concern is that people's behavior will change if they put a mask on. And I'm actually undergoing a research study right now with my university with another psychology professor to see if people wear a mask, A, do they wear the mask? B, are they wearing it correctly? C, will they maintain that two meter distance? Is a mask wearer more likely or less likely to maintain distance? And then we're gonna look for a little bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect and say, from self-perception standpoint, do you think you wore your mask correctly? And we'll have objective evidence of whether they wore their mask correctly, because there is data on hand washing. And when you look at hand washing, the evidence showed that only 5% of people did hand washing according to the CDC guidelines. And that's a 20 second endeavor. 20 seconds is all that it required and only 5% got it right. How about you have to wear a mask for eight, 10 or 12 hours at work? How likely is it that they'll wear it correctly? I don't know, but I'm not optimistic. When you get that study done, you, you give us a dingle, okay? Because we'd like to have you back and talk about that. That is fascinating information to have. But yeah, Michelle, he does I, raise a bunch of, yeah, go ahead, pick it up if you would. Well, I think it's a really important point. For one thing, people tend to be generally egocentric. Um, they think that they are better than others at doing all sorts of things, particularly in, in Western cultures. So there's the risk that people will actually not even notice that they're not wearing masks correctly. Even furthermore, there's the possibility that they might compensate and say, hey, I'm wearing a mask, but I don't need to do other types of health behaviors uh, like hand washing or social distancing. So Absolutely. again, we need, we, need clear, yeah, we need really clear messaging. I mean, this is also part of our looseness, our sort of latitude that's part of our cultural DNA that we see things as like, but there's a wide range of ways we can do things. That's what we're typically used to as compared to in contexts that have had a lot of threat where there's a more narrow range of, uh, of behavior and people really take these rules very seriously. So we really need to negotiate the rules, we need to negotiate um, these kinds of um, preferences for doing things our own way. Michelle, do you have a sense as to why some people are very energetic about following the protocols and others really seem to be struggling with whether to follow them at all? Well, I think people who um, have had a history of threat uh, actually lean tighter. They're more attentive to rules. They crave structure. Others who have had less threat um, don't really notice rules. They're more impulsive. They're, they have, each of these have their own strengths. Um, there's nothing better or worse about tight or loose. It just depends on the context. And the general principle is that when there's real threat, when cases are rising, hospital capacity is being limited, we need to tighten up. And I think the key here is that we can't shame people who are not doing so. We need to negotiate these differences. We need to help people understand it's temporary. And actually that um, if we do these things, then we'll have a better uh, chance of actually getting back to normal more soon, sooner. Well, Jennifer, to that end, can I just get you to address that? Um, it's not a huge group, but it is a, a forceful group of protesters who I think for about the last seven weekends in a row have gone to the South Lawn at Queen's Park and processes saying, not only are they not going to wear a mask, but they believe wearing masks can be harmful to you. What would you say to them? So I don't think there's evidence saying that masks are harmful. Um, maybe we will find out from the study that's being released, but um, it's very unlikely to be harmful. I would say that there is more likely to be a greater benefit versus a harm. Um, and at the end of the day, if we are all wrong on masks and they didn't help, then I don't think we really harmed anybody, but the reverse is if they're wrong and masks can save lives, then you know we may have missed an opportunity to keep Canadians healthy, save lives, save the economy. So it's you know sometimes we have to act based on precautionary principle and make um, decisions and advise people based on what we know so far. I do want to. Let's get, Michelle, you raised it, this issue of shaming people. And I know, for example, about a week and a half ago, I was out on the street, uh, not a crowded street, a street in the neighborhood, having a walk, and somebody wearing a mask walked 
towards me and started to point at their face saying, you know, as if to say, where's your mask? Why aren't you wearing one? And then if I can uh, ask our director, Tony Burke here to put up this picture, this is the mayor of Toronto, John Tory, who in response to a massive gathering of people, about 10,000 in a public park on the first sort of really nice day of the year, was trying to talk to some of the people who were gathering as if to say to them, you know, this isn't kosher what you're doing here. Uh, because there were so many people, there was so much noise, he, he could not be heard behind his mask. So we pulled it down to talk to them. And of course, that's against protocol. He, I'm, I'm not trying to bust the mayor's chops here. He later apologized <laughs> for it. But, but it does appear that there's a lot of shaming going on these days. And I wonder if you'd weigh in as to how useful that is to do. Yeah, you know, we just finished a, a 50 plus country study where we looked at how people react to those people who are trying to tell people to get in line, whether they're verbally reprimanding them uh, or using other types of shaming type of tactics to get them to follow rules. And we find that it's people have a lot of reactance, negative feelings about these people, particularly in loose individualistic cultures where freedom has been prioritized over constraint. So we need to really think about different tactics when we're trying to help people to understand why it's important to wear masks in particular settings when there's a lot of threat. Uh, shaming, I think, is going to backfire. Yeah, Ken, how, how should the message be adjusted if you don't think shaming is a good way to go? Yeah, I don't think shaming and blaming is the right way to do it. I want people to make the decision because it's the correct decision, because it's the right decision, because it's the smart decision, and because they made the decision, so they bought into it. And if we start shaming and blaming, you're going to get pushback naturally. So I think it's much better to educate the population, make them make smart mass choices. And again, remember, we all want the best for the economy, the health of our people, and get through this with as little damage as possible. We've got just a few minutes left here, and I want to put one more really important and timely issue on the table for us to discuss. We have all seen the, um, the demonstrations because of anti-Black racism across North America over the last couple of weeks, and this issue is, uh, well, we are laser focused on this as never before. And somebody by the name of Aaron Thomas from Columbus, Ohio, tweeted something, and apropos of our discussion on masks, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to bring this up right now. He says, I don't feel safe wearing a handkerchief or something else that isn't clearly a protective mask covering my face to the store because I am a black man living in this world. I want to stay alive, but I also want to stay alive. Uh, Michelle, race and the factor that race plays in the discussion we're having today, what can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, I think major minorities are really caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, if they wear masks, many times people may stereotype them in, uh, as being sick or being aggressive and react negatively. But if they don't wear masks, we're also seeing that they're getting penalized also. Uh, and in fact, a lot of work suggests that minorities live in tighter worlds. They get stricter punishments for the same behaviors as compared to majorities. So we really need to be very attentive in our communication that this is something that um, is really uh, falling very hard on m minority communities in terms of an additional uh, other other very important issues of racism, of being differentially affected by corona, both economically and physically. So uh, we need to really prioritize this conversation um, and help people uh, who are experiencing these negativities. Jennifer, I'm sure we can all absolutely feel for the gentleman who put that tweet out, um, you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. What advice would you have on this issue of masking up if, if you're a visible minority? So I definitely understand that racism is a public health issue and it is going to be a major factor affecting social determinants of health, um, especially for the black community. Um, I understand that when some people may judge others for wearing a face mask because of, you know, ethical or cultural um, considerations, definitely people will be can face discrimination for it. However, if masks wearing becomes more normal more people are wearing masks and the sign uh, the mask becomes a sign of you know respect and altruism and of health then mask will lose that negative connotation to being you know fearful or like crime or whatever that negative connotation is so we're hoping that that um, idea of mask will become a more positive thing and that will also help um equalize um in people and avoid discrimination too. Ken, last word to you on this. 
Well, it can even get more complicated uh, because mixed messages are being sent out in places like Quebec, where they have a law that says you must show your face. And there's some discrimination there. And now we're going to come in and say you must cover your face. So it's complicated and we need to be smart and inclusive about these decisions. I want to thank the three of you for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight and really giving us a great deal to think about. Michelle Gelfand, uh, you can read more about her work in Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. She of the University of Maryland. Dr. Ken Milne, South Huron Hospital Association in Exeter, Ontario. He is also Professor of Emergency and Family Medicine at Western University in London. And Dr. Jennifer Kwan. And Jennifer, do you want to give us that uh, hashtag of the work that you're doing if people want to get more? So hashtag masks for Canada and the four is the number four. So masks for Canada. Uh, take a picture of yourself, post a selfie with a mask uh, and tell your friends and family. There we go. Thanks you three, much appreciated. Thanks Thank for having you. us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.